Hi everyone, welcome to Cultural Resource Management Anthropology 451 here at the University of Montana. This is week four. We're going to be discussing two of the earliest laws passed by the U.S. Congress, the Historic, Site, Historic Sites Act of 1935 and the Antiquities Act of 1906. Don't forget that you have your third quiz due this Sunday by midnight. So in terms of what we covered in the last week, which was week three, we talked about cultural resource management players. And uh, we talked about uh, sort of three groups of cultural resource management players. And these are important to keep in mind, especially once we get into the section on the National Historic Preservation Act a couple weeks from now. Um, the folks that always participate in cultural resource management projects, remember, are the federal agencies. Sometimes you'll have a state agency acting on the federal agency's behalf, but more often than not, it's the federal agency. And we talked about important federal agencies in Montana, such as the National Park Service, the Forest Service, and the Bureau of Land Management. We also have another group of people, uh, players in cultural resource management that always participate in projects. And that's either the SHPO or the TIPO. You might also have both participating in a project, but remember that if it's within the bounds of a tribal reservation and that tribe has a tribal historic preservation office, then that TIPO takes the lead as the main consulting agency. And uh, more often than not, the SHPO would not participate in those projects. On the other hand, if there was a federal project proposed off of a tribal reservation, the state historic preservation office would be involved. They would be the lead consulting agency and if it's within the tribal territories, uh, the tribe would participate in the consultation as well. So that's the sort of circumstance in which you'd have both the TIPO and the SHPO involved. So some other folks that participate pretty frequently are the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, um, clients and applicants for federal permits or federal money, those sorts of things, um, as well as consultants who generally work for the federal agencies and the clients and the applicants. You might also have uh, the greater public participating, landowners, other state local governments, curation facilities, and then those nonprofit organizations who might be in a project advocating for the preservation of a cultural resource. So what we're going to do now is get into the laws. And the rest of the class really is going to be dedicated to a study of the important cultural resource laws in the United States. The first one we're going to talk about is the Historic Sites Act of 1935 and the Antiquities Act of 1906. So we're going to do it in that order too. We're going to start with the Historic Sites Act and then go to the Antiquities Act. And that's because next week we're going to dedicate it to ARPA. Now, I think one of the things that you'll learn in the next two weeks is that ARPA, the Archaeological Resource Protection Act, was passed in 1979. And it was an update of the Antiquities Act of 1906. Um, there are two very similar laws. Um, the Antiquities Act of 1906 had become outdated, and so ARPA was passed. So that's why I'm, why I'm going to do it in this sequence, starting with the Historic Sites, Historic Sites Act first. That way you can see both the Antiquities Act and ARPA back to back. After that, we'll proceed with the National Historic Preservation Act. That'll take up several weeks. And the DOT Act, NEPA, and NAGPRA. So that's pretty much taking you through um, the end of the semester, covering all of these laws. So the Historic Sites Act was passed by Congress in 1935. Remember, it's the second law passed. The Antiquities Act was the first one in 1906. Uh, basically, what happened was that this organized all federally managed parks, monuments, and historic sites under the National Park Service's rubric. So this established the National Park Service as a key player in cultural resource management, and it still is to this day. So um, I talked last week about the National Park Service being an important player in cultural resource management. And it's not so much because they're involved in tons and tons of projects, but they manage all the national monuments, all the national parks, and any other sorts of historic sites are, can, are um, managed by the National Park Service. The National Park Service also uh, remember that they uh, control SHPOs and TIPOs and the funding to those. They also issue standards and guidelines, as well as the National Register bulletins. They also establish the qualifications of professionals within cultural resource management. Essentially, what it said was that it's a national policy to preserve for public use historic sites, buildings, and objects of national significance. 
So the goal was to preserve historic uh, buildings and other historic places uh, in, in the name of um, history. So to establish the role of the National Park Service in cultural resource management, it said that the National Park Service will establish a HABS hair program and establish a National Historic Landmarks list. So the HABS hair, this is important today. This is for historic architecture. It's the Historic American Bridge Survey, the Historic American Engineering Record. Anytime there's a building that's in, the, in a proposed federal project, for example, Walmart's going to put up a new building and they're going to take down an old historic building, that old historic building would need to be recorded using HABS hair documentation. So the HABS hair system is a way for the preservation of historic resources, but also the preservation of records associated with those historic resources. Um, so the Historic Sites Act of 1935 established the HABS hair program, which is still around today, a very important part of historic preservation. Another thing it did was establish the National Historic Landmarks List. Now that list is also around today, and it is the preeminent, most important historic resources in the United States. The National Park Service maintains that list. It also established funding to restore historic resources at the government expense. It also established funding for the U.S. government to acquire historic resources as necessary for their preservation. So in every respect, the Historic Sites Act is, is giving the government authority to preserve places that are of historic importance to, to the United States government. It also allowed the Park Service to erect commemorative plaques at the landmarks and operate and manage historic sites. So you'll go to Gettysburg Battlefield, for example, in Pennsylvania, and uh, the National Park Service operates that battlefield. It also established the, an advisory council for historic preservation. It's not the same exact thing as what we what I'm talking about last week in terms of the important player called the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. It's the same model, though, but uh, these days the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation is, is slightly different, but certainly this was its predecessor. So the Historic Sites Act can be considered a precursor of the National Historic Preservation Act. Basically, the Congress told the federal government to establish federal agency to oversee historic preservation. It established the National Park Service at, in 1917, but then told the National Park Service in 1935, you're going to be in control of all these historic places. It established the Historic Resource List, the National Historic Landmark, again, which is still on the books basically established this idea that if we can't preserve it physically, how can we preserve its history? That's where the Habs hair documentation comes into play. There's uh, plenty of instances in the United States where development uh, was forced to go through areas and historic structures, buildings, bridges, those sorts of things were destroyed in the process of more modern construction. In order to record those, the Habs hair process is extremely important basically established rules for historicity and what makes historic resources, which have which were a model for the National Historic Preservation Act passed later, about 30 years later in 1966. And it established a means to commemorate historic places and important events to the United States. And then again, also established that advisory council to oversee historic preservation. So it did a lot of the things that 30 years later, the National Historic Preservation Act improved upon. So the Antiquities Act was passed in 1906. This was the first federal cultural resource law. Its goal was to prevent destruction of archaeological sites on public land. It also required permits for archaeological excavation at important sites like Chaco Canyon. And remember why this law was passed, because we had people going into these places like Chaco Canyon and the Four Corners region um, excavating archaeological sites without the proper expertise, with the goal being to collect those artifacts and sell them to museums. And it did require that artifacts be put in museums. And so in terms of the Antiquities Act of 1906, I, I put together a MPS video for you on the Antiquities Act, and that's available on Moodle. This law also gave 
all presidents the right to declare national monuments. And this is the most important part of the law today. The Antiquities Act and its historic aspects aren't used that much, but every president establishes national monuments. Basically, these are historic landmarks, historic and prehistoric structures, and other objects of historic or scientific interest that are situated upon lands owned or controlled by the government of the United States. National monuments have taken on a whole new spin, though, and don't necessarily have to be related to historicity anymore. Um, in terms of the Antiquities Act of 1906, the, the penalties were fairly minimal for the violation. 90 days was the maximum jail sentence, and the maximum monetary fine was $500. What we're going to learn next week in terms of the Archaeological Resource Protection Act is that those penalties were not deterring people from looting archaeological sites, um, because they could sell the artifacts that they collected for far more than five hundred dollars. It also had a um, became there became a broad interpretation of national monuments. So, um, for example, Roosevelt set a precedent with establishing the Grand Canyon as a national monument, setting aside eight hundred thousand acres. While the Grand Canyon does have a, lots and lots of historic aspects, especially related to Native American culture, Roosevelt's purpose for establishing the National Monument there really was for the natural beauty of the Grand Canyon, not for the Native American historicity of it, even though that's obviously quite important. That wasn't why Roosevelt did it. He really was interested in the, the beautiful nature of the Grand Canyon. And so even though the Mo Antiquities Act was established for presidents to establish national monuments related to his historic things, since Roosevelt's establishment of the Grand Canyon as a national monument, most presidents and, and many, if not all presidents, have established many beautiful natural places as national monuments. So it's, it's become something that's not ex, ex, that has not just been related to um, historic places. Um, so in 2011, the then uh, congressman from Montana, Danny Rayberg, uh, introduced a proposal to modify the Antiquities Act, uh, meaning that uh, it needed to go through Congress as well. So now the president can just establish national monuments without any consultation with Congress. This proposed modification, which did not pass, would have, al have allowed Congress to be consulted on the establishment of national monuments. Basically what it says is that the president couldn't unilaterally declare monuments, which seems fair, um, but the law did not pass. So in terms of um, the monuments in Montana, we have the Little Bighorn Battlefield uh, over in eastern Montana, east of Billings, Pompeii's Pillar along the Columbia River, um, and the Upper Missouri River Breaks. So the impact of the Antiquities Act was that it's the first major cultural resource law. It established the U.S. government as a protector of cultural resources. It said that the government's responsibility is to fund protection of historic places, and it's the government's responsibility to enforce protection of those places. Um, but today, the Antiquities Act, again, is used mostly by presidents to establish national monuments. And then in 1979, as we'll talk about next week, ARPA was enacted by Congress to replace and strengthen the protection of historic sites on federal land. And we'll talk about that next week.